Hello. Thank you all for coming here. Oh, there's so much excitement. Um, I know many of you have made long trips to be here with us today to celebrate this unique rite of passage. It is my great honor to welcome you to Alper Medical School's 17th Annual Ceremony of Commitment to Medicine. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dean Jack Elias. Dr. Elias is the seventh Dean of Medicine and Biological Sciences at Brown. A preeminent physician scientist, he brings to his new role decades of experience as a National Institute of Health funded researcher, a clinician specializing in pulmonary medicine, and chair of the Department of Medicine at the Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Elias is a member of the Institute of Medicine and served as president of the Association of American Physicians. He was appointed chair of the Department of Medicine at Yale and physician in chief of Yale New Haven Hospital in 2006. In a professional career spanning more than 30 years, Dr. Elias has cared for patients with a wide variety of lung ailments and injuries and has conducted research on conditions including asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pneumonia, pulmonary fibrosis, and the effects of smoking. He earned his bachelor's degree in MD at the University of Pennsylvania, served an internship at Tufts New England Medical Center, and completed residency in medicine and fellowships in both pulmonary and critical care medicine in allergy and clinical immunology at the University of Pennsylvania. An immunobiologist, Dr. Elias has trained scores of young researchers and published more than 200 original peer review research papers. He holds several patents with more pending. He is married to Sandra Gross Elias, an attorney, and the couple has one daughter. Thank you very much, Gabby. This is a, a truly wonderful, wonderful day. It's one of the most joyous days uh, of the annual academic calendar. Um, as the Dean of the Alpert Medical School, I welcome all of the parents, family members, spouses, significant others, and friends who made it uh, to join us uh, today for your loved one's white coat ceremony. Let me especially congratulate the class of 2019 a truly, truly amazing group. This is the biggest class that the Alpert Medical School has ever had. We have 144 students uh, in this class, uh, and it is truly a milestone for this very young medical school uh, in terms of its growth and development. You come from 29 states in the District of Columbia. Some of you have just been in school, in, in college just a little while ago. Others are, are here as part of their second careers. You've come from, to us from the Peace Corps, you've owned businesses, you've worked at places like Boeing, you've been NCAA champions, and you've even been documentary film producers. Uh, but what I can tell you is no matter what you've done before coming here, you're now entering into the most wonderful profession uh, in the world. It's a very, very uh, exciting time to be in, uh, entering medicine. Today, when I place the white coat on you, I need to point out that this is a world that you're entering that has both privilege and great responsibility. You will have the privilege of being a trusted advisor to your patients, that you will hold their secrets. They will tell you things they have told nobody else through good times and through bad times. You will also have a responsibility, a responsibility like no other. You are committing to your patients to keep them safe to make them well, to always put their welfare before your welfare, and to always have their welfare as your top priority. You will have days of impressive success, 
There is no better feeling in the world than helping a sick person get healthy. It is, it is a wonderful, wonderful experience. You're also going to have days where you fail. These are going to be very sad days. They're going to be days where you realize that our knowledge, our tools are just not where we need them to be. You need to take that as inspiration to go out and make them better. One of my joys today is I get probably the only time all year the rapt attention of the whole class <laughs> and they have to listen to everything I say whether they like it or not. So, so there are four points that I want to make for the class of 2019. First, this is the time during your training where you have to go out and find your passion. In medical school, in your subsequent training, you're going to get to experience unbelievable things, things you can't even imagine now. You need to jump in with both feet, with massive gusto, and experience everything. You have to, during your training, figure out where you belong. You have to find your passion in life. Medicine is big, medicine is complex, it's got multiple facets. You need to find out where you belong uh, in that process. You have to get to a point where for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, when you come downstairs in the morning and you're walking out the door to do X for 8, 10, or 12 hours that day, it puts a smile on your face. If it puts a smile on your face, you've used your training widely and you have found your passion. The second point I want to make to you is this is a time where you need to learn to find your passion. Your patients have a very important story to tell you. They have a life's history to share with you. You need to listen to them. And then you need to integrate them into the complexities of our healthcare system. Listening to your patients will never be replaced by anything that we do technologically in the medical arena. The third point I want to make to you is that you have responsibilities. You have to commit yourself to advancing knowledge. It is your responsibility to ensure that the next generation of physicians has, have tools and knowledge that are better than what you're going to learn now and for the rest of your careers. I vividly recall as a medical student being in the lab of a man, Dr. Peter Knoll, at the University of Pennsylvania. Peter Knoll was a pathologist. Uh, Peter, uh, one day, I remember we were in, in the lab, and he realized that there was an abnormality on the chromosome blot of people with a certain kind of leukemia. Nobody knew what it meant. We figured out that he figured out that a piece of one chromosome had been moved to another chromosome where it didn't belong. That was called the Philadelphia chromosome. I was a medical student, as you heard, in Philadelphia, so every medical student in Philadelphia had to learn about the Philadelphia chromosome. Uh, but nobody knew what it meant. Over the years, somebody else came by and said, gee, this is now a thing called a translocation. We have what's called the BCR able translocation. A piece of one gene was put next to a piece of another gene where it didn't belong. That generated a new protein. That protein turned out to be a new growth factor, and that growth factor drove the leukemia. But what was even more amazing is a couple years later, someone figured out a way to block that protein. And in my lifetime, I have gotten to watch in this one disease, a disease that was immensely horrible, go and become a disease that can be controlled with a pill. And that's really an amazing, amazing event to experience during one's professional life. What I want to say to you is keep your eyes open, keep your thinking caps on. Medicine is far from perfect. It needs you to help make it better for the next generation. The last point I want to make to you may make some of you scratch your head being you just took your biochemistry exam uh, <laughs> last week. And that is, you are not far away from being a teacher or a mentor yourself. Before you know it, you will be on the wards, you'll be the senior student, you'll be the intern, you'll be the resident. Accept that right, accept that responsibility, really revel in it. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience. So let me close. Let me close by reminding you that this is a great day, a great family day. You are here amongst your loved ones starting what will be the most miraculous journey that you've ever taken. 
I want to point out to you also, though, that you're not just here with your loved ones and your family. You're joining a new family. You're joining the Warren Alpert School of Medicine family. Uh, and this is a family of pride. You see by the people here. It's a, it's a wonderful family to join. You, are, you need to remember that the family are here, for, the faculty are here for you and are massively committed to your growth, development, and success. Please accept their mentorship and guidance as the years progress and challenges present themselves. Congratulations, class of 2019. Now it is my turn to share some of my thoughts um, as a medical student. Uh, and first, actually, on behalf of the um, MD16 class, we would like to thank uh, Barbara Fuller uh, for, for bringing us all here. The Arnold Gold Foundation was founded in 1998 at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons by Dr. Gold and his wife, Sandra Gold. They were witnessing a trend that worried them. The Gold saw young physicians who were, who, were, who were very well trained in science and technology, but who lacked caring and compassion. In, res in response, the Gold Foundation worked to encourage integrity, compassion, respect, and empathy. One of the Foundation's programs includes the White Coat Ceremony, to welcome medical students into the profession and set the expectations of nurturing and developing these important qualities from early on. While the white coat ceremony is now a tradition in most, in most medical schools in the US, the idea of empathy, it's not always so top of mind. Simply put, empathy is the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Some say that empathy is an immutable quality you're either born empathetic or you're not. Others say that empathy can be honed and exercised. They believe our empathy can grow. The people in the second camp say that we can cultivate empathy intentionally, just as we cultivate the skills to take vitals or tend to a wound. And we cultivate it unintentionally too. Many times, people who have gone through difficult situations can understand the pain of others. That has certainly been true for me and other classmates who have suffered deep personal losses, the death of a parent, a sibling, or the toll of a serious illness. This does not mean that only those who have suffered greatly can empathize with the pain of others. But our suffering certainly helps in giving us the grace to be kind when we can remember how much we once needed kindness too. You're all a few months into your journey, and you're no doubt worried about science and statistics. Empathy may be far from your mind at the moment, I know. So why am I asking you to think about it now? Why are medical school curriculums being changed to incorporate reflective exercises that could enhance our empathy? For starters, it makes us better doctors. There is no question about that. A large part of training to become a physician involves learning about the human anatomy, the way the body functions, and then the pathology, how to diagnose and treat it. But the practice of medicine requires creating a personal connection, a, bo a bond of trust between doctor and patient, oftentimes in the most vulnerable of moments. And this is where empathy comes in to make us better. Studies have shown that patients will choose an empathetic doctor over one who's purely technically skilled, regardless of the skill level. But there is yet another reason for us to be empathetic. It turns out it is better for our health. Given the demands of our training and of our future professions, empathy should also be a tool for self-preservation. Let me elaborate. In the past few months, you, the members of the MD-19 class, have experienced a transition to starting medical school. Most of you moved to Providence, away from family and friends, and are now in the most academically challenged environment you have ever been. It is said that medical school is like that trying to drink water from a fire hydrant. 
the amount of information we must master is staggering. If you're trying to be conservative about this, you can assume that each lecture we attend, and let's say that we go to 30 lectures in, thir in our three-week blocks, may have about 50 facts or concepts that we should thoroughly understand. This means that we end up trying to memorize about 1,500 facts to prepare for a single test. And then at the end of a year and a half of test taking, we must all prepare for the one test to rule them all, step one. <laughs> All of this can become overwhelming quickly. And in addition to wanting to perform well and test, we want to be good communicators. We want to volunteer. We want to do research. And of course, we want to uh, keep the friendships and family connections we had before starting medical school. Every single student here had to prove themselves in numerous ways before being admitted to medical school. We are no strangers to hard work and dedication. We're all competitive in nature, mostly with ourselves, and we can be our harshest judges. And when faced with the multiple external expect expectations of volunteering, research, academics, or personal life, and the pressure we put on ourselves, it's easy to lose sight of what's important. A recent study surveyed students before starting medical school to measure the rates of depression. They found that the rates of depression in students before they started medical school were similar to those of their peers. A different study looked at depression once we start medical school, and they found an increase. And about 20% of medical students met criteria for either major or moderate depression. Other studies showed 30% of students report symptoms of depression. And in yet one more study, 50% of medical students experienced burnout emotional exhaustion, low sense of accomplishment, and found themselves treating patients in a depersonalized way. These statistics are not meant to be grim, but they represent a reality all too important to be ignored. I chose to speak about this today because I believe that in addition to helping us become better physicians, exercising empathy can help us cope with the stress of our profession. It can help us be better to ourselves and consequently to one another. By being present in the pain and suffering of our patients, we can reflect on our circumstances, our extreme privilege to live in this country, to have our health and the company of loved ones, and to be in training for a career in service of others. So remember as you move through your training to take the time to sit with your patients a little longer to actively listen to their complaints and their life story. Do not give in so easily to cynicism, to the temptation to hurry through the next task. And just as important, be present with each other and listen to the experiences of your classmates, because you, of all people, are uniquely poised to understand them. And by being present in our own struggles, we can be better friends and better people. Thank you. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Elion, the Charles O. Cook, MD, Distinguished Visiting Lectureship, was established in 1994 through a bequest by Mrs. Ruth Cook Peterson. The purpose of this endowment was to create a lectureship in a branch of medicine that holds promise of significant and lasting benefit to the community, to the delivery of healthcare services, into the medical education at Brown. We are very grateful to Mrs. Peterson for her gift, and today we're honored to welcome Dr. Ilion to the distinguished family of Charles O. Cook lecturers. Dr. Ilion is a member of Brown, of Brown's original medical school class of 1975. He followed a somewhat non-traditional career path since graduating, combining clinical medicine, academics, and industry. He founded his first company, Heart Lab, in 1994, right, based right here in Rhode Island. Heart Lab quickly grew to be the world's leading designer and supply, supplier of digital image and information networks for cardiology. He has chaired several international committees to create and promote 
standardization in hospital information systems. In 2009, he started his current company, Chartwise Medical Systems, again based in Rhode Island. Chartwise designs innovative software solutions for hospitals to improve clinical documentation and data analytics. Dr. Elion is a practicing board certified cardiologist in Providence, Rhode Island, and a clinical associate professor of medicine at the Alpert Medical School. He has served on several hospital finance committees and boards. He was the first national chairman of the Brown Medical School Annual Fund and former member of the Brown Medical Alumni Association. Dr. Elion is passionate about his work with the Swananoa Gathering, an educational program of Warren Wilson College near Asheville, North Carolina, consistent of a series of week-long workshops in various folk, arts, and music. With over 45 years of experience in computing and more than 30 years of, of experience in medical computing and information standards, he has committed his career to innovations in high-value service and healthcare delivery to maximize efficiency and cost-effectiveness. When I was a medical student, I hated any story that started when I was a medical student. <laughs> when I was a medical student, I had very long hair. I had a collection of tie-dyed scrub shirts. Some of you know what tie-dyed is, maybe had some tie-dyed materials. The rest of you, maybe you've read about it in the history books. <clears throat> My tie-dyed scrub shirts looked suspiciously like many of the scrub shirts that were at the hospital. I can't explain that. <laughs> and every morning, I'd climb on my bike, and I would bike down to the hospital. And when I got there, I would take off the tie-dyed scrub shirt. I'd put on a dress shirt. I'd tie my hair back in a ponytail and tuck it down in the shirt. And I'd reach into the saddlebag, and I would take out my white coat. And I would have my own personal little white coat ceremony and I would don the mantle, I would put on my superhero costume, and I would go into the hospital and feeling that I had just joined a great tradition that's hundreds or thousands of years old, and that white coat for me was transformational. Putting it on, I felt like I was transformed from hippie to Hippocratic. <laughs> it gave me a code that I could live by. When I was a medical student, I met a pretty red-haired nurse in the ICU. She thought I was a smart aleck. <laughs> Matter of fact, she didn't like me very much. She hated me on site, reported me to the head nurse, said she never wanted to see me again. <clears throat> we were engaged to be married three months later. <laughs> and married eight months after that. She's here with me today after 41 years. <clears throat> and she still thinks I'm a smart aleck. <clears throat> When I was a medical student, I worked at WBRU. At that time, it was number one in the Providence market. You're listening to WBRU. <laughs> Just a little left of center on your radio dial. <laughs> Some of you may remember when radios had dials. <clears throat> at the end of the day at the hospital, my little ceremony would reverse. I'd take off the white coat and tuck it into the saddlebag. I'd take off the dress shirt. I'd literally and figuratively let down my hair, put on the tie-dyed scrub shirt, and cycle up to WBRU, where I had an evening radio program, uh, progressive rock or album rock, and I did that for seven years. Well, over the years, my little mini ceremony with my white coat continues, and it's taken many different forms. I'd be in the computer research lab, and it was time to go make rounds in the ICU. So I'd tuck in my shirt, put on my shoes, put on a tie, and don my superhero costume and go make rounds in the ICU. From algorithms to cardiac rhythms, saving lives, it's a tough job, but somebody's gotta do it. <laughs> well, for the longest time, I considered my white coat to be transformative, something that covered up what I was and turned me into something different, disguising that hippie and turning it into something decidedly more medical. Until one day, on the intensive care unit, I was caring for an elderly woman. She had multi-organ failure, clearly at the end of her life. Her systems were all shutting down one at a time. I kind of felt like I was standing outside of a house at night, watching the lights being turned off one set at a time. And I was standing at the bedside with the patient's daughter, Judy. And Judy was very tearful. She was very sad occasion. 
It was death with dignity, but it was still going to be death. And I felt myself starting to tear up. Old wounds were being opened, and I was consumed with the sadness. And I felt that I needed to leave the room, because everybody knows people in white coats don't cry. And I was most of the way out of the room, and I, to this day, I don't know why I stopped. And I turned around and went back to the bedside. And I decided it was okay if Judy saw me cry. And we stood there together, and I sat with her as her mother died. A few weeks after her mother died, Judy, has, Judy sent me a note, which I've kept to this day, and I'd like to read it to you. Dear Dr. Elian, it has taken me this long to write to you because I've been searching for the words to express my profound gratitude for your kindness as my mother was dying. Your intuition is remarkable. You knew what I needed to hear even before I asked the questions. I don't think anyone could have guided me as gently, as thoroughly, as thoughtfully, or as wisely as you did through the waiting, the decision, and the end of my mother's life. I hope you are involved in teaching new young doctors. They will be privileged to learn more than cardiology from you. Please accept my thanks from the depths of my heart. I will never forget your kindness. Now I read this to remind myself that I'm convinced that all of those events unfolded as they did because on that day I made a choice. I chose to not let the white coat transform me into something different. Instead, I let it enhance me. That long-haired hippie in the tie-dyed shirt, the computer geek, the smart aleck with the weird sense of humor, my own set of experiences, wounds, and pains. That white coat added to it on that day. Now most of you have probably guessed where this is going. Parents and friends, you should all be so proud of the accomplishments of the students that have gotten them here to date. And students, you should be incredibly proud of sitting here today, awaiting the opportunity to don your white coat and to take another big step towards joining a century-old tradition and profession. But be sure that the white coat adds to who you are, enhances who you are, and does not in any way cover it up. In the words of Oscar Wilde, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. <laughs> I switched from the electric guitar to the acoustic guitar, and I've never quite figured out how to combine that with clinical medicine. <laughs> but I did figure out that it's kind of a fun way to end a keynote speech. <laughs> While I'm setting up, I just have a few words, a few more words for the students. If you happen to find yourself on a clinical rotation with me, be forewarned, I'm tough. I'm going to teach you but I'm going to quiz you, because I want to know if you're getting it. I'm going to help you put your findings and facts together and synthesize it so you understand the underlying pathophysiology. But I'm going to ask you why. Why? Why? You're going to get so sick of it, it's going to make you want to cry. <laughs> but all the time, I'm wondering, do they appreciate what I'm doing? Parents. Maybe you ask yourselves sometimes, do they appreciate all the hard work? There's two, the teachers that are here, you also ask yourselves that question, do they appreciate all the hard work that they put in? Well, I'd like to give you my musical answer. This is dedicated to the parents, the families, the teachers, clinicians, mentors, and even deans that are here today <laughs> celebrating this enhancement. Unfortunately, Crosby, Stills, and Nash couldn't be here today. <laughs> so I'm going to have to do the three-part harmony all by myself. <laughs> I just want you to know that here at the Warren Albert Medical School, nothing is pre-recorded. <laughs> we don't lip sync. You're about to hear a live performance, but <clears throat> I'm a computer geek, and I'm not above a little um, computer augmentation.
now they all get their coat it will denote a code they can live by but they must remain themselves a bit in hast but no more tie-dye and teach children well, their mid school hell will slowly go by and feed them multi choice. The ones they pick, the ones we'll grade by. And if you ever ask them why, makes them want to cry so just look at them and sigh Can't know the fears your students grew by, and so query them with care and hope they dare to boldly reply and teach your students well their mid school health will slowly go by and if you ever ask them why it makes them want to cry so just look at them Thank you so much. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, now I would like to introduce to you Dr. Preston Calvert, president of the Brown Medical Alumni Association. Dr. Calvert is a member of the Brown class of 1976 and the Brown MD class of 1979. After Brown, he trained in neurology when on active duty in the US Army at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and then as an Army-sponsored fellow in neuro-ophthalmology at the Wilmer Eye Institute at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Calvert served for 15 years total in the U.S. Army, serving as Assistant Chief to the Neurology Service at Walter Reed, among other positions. He finished his service with the rank of Major. On leaving the Army in 1990, he entered private practice of neurology and neuro-ophthalmology in Virginia until he became the Vice Chair of Neurology and Director of the Neurology Neurosurgery Outpatient Clinic at Johns Hopkins Hospital in 1998, a position he held until 2000. Dr. Calvert still serves as Assistant Professor part-time in the Department of Neurology at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. In 1988, he shared the General Claire Cheneau Award of Walter Reed Army Medical Center as its outstanding medical staff member. And in 2000, he was a recipient of the Johns Hopkins Neurology Residence Annual Teaching Award. Dr. Calvert is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology and a fellow of the North American Neuro-Ophthalmology Society. 
He has served on the board of directors of the North American Neuroophthalmology Society since 2002 and as president of the society from 2010 to 2012. He subsequently served as the society's executive board chairman until 2014. Dr. Calvert has served as class representative for the MD class of 1979 since 2006 and on the board of directors of the Brown Medical Alumni Association since 2008, where he currently serves as president. Dr. Calvert's second career is as professional sports car racer in the Pirelli World Challenge Series, where he was just awarded the Rookie of the Year trophy in the GTS class after the 2015 racing season. He also finished on the podium in third place in his SCCA Club Racing National Championship race last month. He's actively involved in research in race car driver safety and training. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gabby. And I want to welcome uh, the, um, the uh, class here for their white coat ceremony. It's, uh, it's a great day for you and for your families. Uh, I think we all know that uh, this is an accomplishment not just for you all, but for your families. It, it takes, uh, takes more than yourself to get here, and uh, we, we welcome the people who are supportive of you as well. Uh, it's a big day for all of you, so welcome. Um, I'm here representing the Brown Medical Alumni Association. Uh, the Brown Medical Alumni Association has the tradition of uh, supporting the medical students as much as possible from beginning all the way through their medical school careers and then always afterwards uh, as you join us. And we, we start that symbolically by uh, supplying a white coat for the white coat ceremony. So that is uh, provided to you by the BMAA. And uh, the BMAA is an organization that is, uh, is organized of people who are your, an your professional ancestors and uh, that you will hopefully eventually join. It's, uh, it's a group that has uh, your best interest at heart. We all uh, have been where you are, and we all think a lot about what it's like to be a medical student. We know the, the good parts and the tough parts, and uh, we're, we're always available to help you, not only while you're here, uh, activities that you have in mind we help try to support, but uh, as you get ready to move on into your uh, internship and residency, we're part of uh, a process to try to help you make good decisions for yourself about where to go, what to do. Um, Dean Elias uh, has a, uh, a special way of uh, embodying the idea of finding your passion and finding what makes uh, medicine feel unlike work uh, as you go through a, a long and hard career. And that's a very important thing and we would like to be a part of that. So we, we welcome you uh, and uh, we uh, hope you will uh, participate with us uh, when you're finished, but uh, let us know if we can help you in any way while you're here. So. Uh, welcome from the Brown Medical Alumni Association. And I believe we are now ready to proceed with our uh, coats ceremony. The, uh, the first uh, recipient of their white coat is Dillam Aluthke. Ananya Anand. <laughs> Clarissa, Clarissa Andre. Kaushik Anam. That's Kaushik Anam. Emmanuel, Emmanuel Asidu.
Alan Atkins. Maya Ayub. Dora Bakar. <laughs> Moving on, Thalen Barreto. <laughs> Mara Benson. Karishma Batia. Kimberly Bowerman. Michael Boyajan. <laughs> Chelsea Boyd. Kinsey Brigham. <laughs> Victoria Brown. Ralph Cabezas. <laughs> Sir Leon Chow. Amber Carduce. <laughs> Audrey Carr. Carla Castillo. That's Carla Castillo. <laughs> Stephanie Chang. Rudy Chen. <laughs> Alexa Choi. Catherine Chicolello. <laughs> Ms. 
Corinne Cobb. Nathan Coppersmith. Adrian Cotarello. <laughs> Abigail Davies. Hiba Danani. <laughs> Eleanor DiBiasio. Michelle Diop. Anna Dupreet. somewhat of a deja vu moment, Olivia Dupree. <laughs> Julia Donner. Kristen Durbin. <laughs> Julianne Edwards. Aaron Iceman. <laughs> Shane Fishbach. Emily Fu. <laughs> Daryl Gachette. Carolina Galindo.
Jessica Gardner. Yashil Gosalkar. <laughs> Josha Goash. Giancarlo Glick. <laughs> Elisa Glubach Gonzalez. Mark Gotting. <laughs> Leslie Gonzalez. John Hammond. <laughs> Carrie Hampton. Daniel Hashemi. <laughs> Annika Havner. June Kit He. <laughs> Tiffany Ho. Thomas Shu. <laughs> Hans Huber. Alexa Canbergs. <laughs> Jessica Gardner. 
David Karambizi. Fez Khan. Carmen Kilpatrick. Justin Kleiner. <laughs> Michelle Ko. Alexander Kuzmarski. Amy LeCount. Eliana Laguna. <laughs> Matthew Lamb. Peter Lauro. <laughs> Brian Lee. Matthew Lee. <laughs> Yao Lu. Connie Lou. <laughs> Noah Lubin. Rory Lubner.
<laughs> Gabrielle Lupu. Emily McDuffie. Denise Marte. Rani Matuk. Damon McIntyre. Shayla Medina. Nihal Metha. <laughs> Shayla Mintier. Dami Molina. <laughs> Shriya Muralithi Run. Diana Nardella. <laughs> Natasha Wynn. Xavier Orcutt. <laughs> Joseph Park. Lauren Park. <laughs> Elizabeth Perry. Matthew Perry. <laughs> Anne.
Andrew Pilling. Andrew Powers. Elise Presser. Lindor Chunai. Robert Kwan. Mariska Raglo DeFranco. Radhika Rajan. Catherine Rand. <laughs> Leah Rivard. Cullen Roberts. <laughs> Daniela Rojas. Alicia Rowland. <laughs> Brian Russell. Kirsten Sapp. <laughs> Nicholas Selke. Ashish Shaw. (laughs) 
Sahar Shahamatdar. Adam Schur. <laughs> Alan Sierra. Kelly Scrable. Brandon Smith. Nari Son. <laughs> Greta Solenop. Julia Solomon. <laughs> Ella Sorcher. Jonathan Staloff. <laughs> Danielle Stern. Cynthia Susai. <laughs> Solomon Swartz. Austin Tam. James Tench. Mary Tarantino. <laughs> Ooh.
Elizabeth Tarr. Margaret Thorson. <laughs> Alexander Tran. Eric Tung. Fabian Vargas. Ethan Vorell. Jonathan Vu. Paul Wallace. Jason Wang. Jing Wong. John Warwick. Joseph Warzynski. Sarah Weatherall. Barrett Weiss. <laughs> Daniel Wong. Madeline Wozniak.
Tommy Wright. Sandra Yan. <laughs> Se Young Yoon. Alexander Zhu. Now it's time for the MD19 class to actually stand up and thank your family and friends with a round of applause for them. Yeah. 